You're listening to the Corbett Report. Happy New Year, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, it is 2019. Yes, I am still James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Yes, this is the New Year of Propaganda Watch, the weekly series where we dissect propaganda from around the web and dinosaur media for your edification. And yes, I do have the annual... New Year's cold that I always seem to get. I don't know if I always get a cold around New Year's, but I always remember it when I get one. So you'll just have to put up with my voice uh, while it is in its husky state at the moment. It's a good thing I don't talk for a living, right? Ha ha. Well, anyway, again, Happy New Year. Thank you for joining us for this week's edition of Propaganda Watch. And we're going to kick the New Year off in style with a very flashy report from Reuters that made its way into the news feed in December. Uh, Johnson & Johnson knew for decades that asbestos lurked in its baby powder. This is a very voluminous Reuters investigation, and here's the couple-sentence summary. J&J Johnson & Johnson has been compelled to share thousands of pages of company memos, internal reports, and other confidential documents with lawyers for some of the 11,700 plaintiffs now claiming that the company's talc caused their cancers, including thousands of women with ovarian cancer. As a Reuters examination of many of those documents, as well as deposition and trial testimony, shows that from at least 1971 to the early 2000s, the company's raw talc and finished powders sometimes tested positive for small amounts of asbestos, and that company executives, mine managers, scientists, doctors, and lawyers fretted over the problem and how to address it while failing to disclose it to regulators or the public. Now, this, as I say, is a very voluminous report and some interesting, I I don't know if I'll use the term bombshell, but some very interesting information about Johnson & Johnson, what it knew about its baby powder for a long time, but this will, of course, come as no particular surprise to long-term viewers and readers of The Corbett Report, specifically my 2016 editorial, and everything is super swell at Johnson & Johnson, folks, just don't mention the baby powder cancer, where we looked at this uh, story for the first time, and uh, back at that time, it was only about 1,200 women who were suing Johnson & Johnson for their ovarian cancer being caused by the Johnson Johnson baby powder, which they'd been applying to their private parts for decades, as Johnson & Johnson's ad campaigns had told them to do, well, well, that didn't work out so well for those that developed ovarian cancer. And as I say, back in 2016, it was 1,200 women that were suing. Uh, at this point, as the Reuters investigation points out, over 11,000 plaintiffs now suing for cancer caused by Johnson & Johnson's talcum products. Now, This report, as I say, is extremely detailed. It's a very long, very thorough investigation with a lot of information, some bombshell quotes from some of the documents that they've unearthed here. Um, No final product will ever be made, which will be totally free from respirable particles. Uh, No mother is going to powder her baby with 1% of a known carcinogen, irregardless of the large safety factor, said an FDA official back in 1975, because this issue does go back well, half a century, really, at this point, um, since they first started noticing the the uh, the asbestos in the talcum uh, supply that they were getting at that time in the 1960s. They were sourcing from the Italian Alps. Uh, they eventually bought some mines in Vermont that had the exact same problem. Um, but and as this report shows, it's all throughout, scattered throughout decades of internal corporate memos and documents that they knew about this problem and were working on ways to handle it. One of the most interesting parts, way down at the bottom of this investigation, if you're interested in the crisis of science and peer-reviewed research, uh, I would direct you to a guiding hand on talc safety research down at the very bottom of this report, where they go through the uh, point that uh, Johnson & Johnson in 1973, looking to head off some of this criticism, commissioned a scientific report, quote-unquote scientific report. They paid for and told the team what they wanted, which was a study that would show that uh, the incidence of cancer in these subjects is no different from that of the Italian population or the rural control group. And that's exactly what they got. And uh, eventually, this study that they paid for and they commissioned uh, was positively cited in a review in the British Journal of Industrial Medicine that was anonymously written by... J&J's own executive in charge of their scientific research department and uh, was 
uh, just uh, it's just a, a case study in how corporations have managed and guided the peer-reviewed process of science for a long time. And if all of this investigation isn't enough, you can actually go into the document cloud. Uh, they have dozens and dozens of these documents, along with little explanatory notes from the, the author of this article, uh, citing all of the different things that they're going through in this report. Lots of information and evidence. So... Anyway, as I say, this will not be exactly new news to Corporate Report uh, devotees, but it is at any rate more fuel to the fire and more for the tens of thousands now of litigants that are suing Johnson & Johnson for their baby powder caused cancer. So what is Johnson & Johnson's reaction to this? Oh, I bet you can guess. <laughs> Well, Johnson & Johnson shares plunge after a report it knew of asbestos and baby powder reports the street, because, of course, the only thing that really matters in this story is Johnson & Johnson's stock price. Which, interestingly enough, if you go to look up this story in any of the usual places, that's one of the only things that uh, any of the reports mentions, is the stock price. The stock price plunged. Oh, the stock price recovered. Oh, the stock price is going to rebound after this, guys. You should get back on Johnson & Johnson stock. It's all about the stock. But anyway, the street apparently got an email from Johnson & Johnson in which it said, uh, the, a, a corporate executive said, The Reuters article is one-sided, false, and inflammatory. Simply put, the Reuters story is an absurd... Wait for it. Here we go. Conspiracy theory. In that it apparently has spanned over 40 years, orchestrated among generations of global regulators, the world's foremost scientists and universities, leading independent labs and J&J &J employees themselves. No, no, no. You see, I, I think you don't understand what theory <laughs> means in this context, because, no, there was a conspiracy, and you can actually read it for yourself in these documents, where you can see the executives talking to the people in their research department, talking to regulators, admitting that this was happening, that this was a problem, that they were looking for ways to minimize the asbestos or to, uh, to uh, jigger the regulations so that they didn't uh, affect the company's ability to sell its product, etc., this isn't a conspiracy theory. This is documented conspiracy fact. But they use the magic words, absurd conspiracy theory. In fact, Johnson Johnson even took out full-page ads in the newspapers to defend themselves against this vile smear by the Reuters reporting team. Um, which is a bit of a tempest in a teacup, because the uh, report really doesn't even get to the base issues. It's not like it's saying that this was some sort of grand big pharma conspiracy to deliberately put asbestos in baby powder to kill as many people as possible or anything of that sort. It's just that mineralogically they are similar, they are found in the same ore deposits, it would be almost, if not entirely impossible to utterly separate any source of talcum from any trace of asbestos. Uh, although, now since 2003, they've been sourcing their asbestos from China, and the company insists that not a single test has ever found any trace of asbestos. It's 100% asbestos-free. Trust us, guys. You can trust us this time. <laughs> right. Anyway, uh, but this re report doesn't even really al allege anything of that sort. It's just saying that the company knew there were traces of asbestos in its baby powder and continued to sell and and, and cover that fact up. And here are the documents to prove it. It's really not even that bombshell when you really look into it. Uh, it's just documented fact. Uh, the, the, the part that often comes up is they'll say, oh, it was only trace amounts. Don't worry, it's just trace amounts. And, you know, I mean, it's less than 1% of this baby powder is asbestos. And, you know, so it's no big deal. Although the Reuters report does accurately report, well, the World Health Organization and other authorities recognize no safe level of exposure to asbestos. While most people exposed never develop cancer, for some, even small amounts of asbestos are enough to trigger the disease years later. Just how small hasn't been established. Many plaintiffs allege that the amounts they inhaled when they dusted themselves with tainted talcum powder were enough. So make of those claims what you will, but at any rate, the science does not say that this is outlandish, wacky conspiracy theory. It has not been established that there is any safe level of exposure. In fact, the main regulators and authorities recognize no safe level of exposure to asbestos, whether it's trace amounts or others. So there you go. That's the, the crux of the argument and the, the case. But once again, look at the corporate response. Conspiracy theory, folks. It's a conspiracy theory. So... 
it is essentially exactly as I reported last year. Remember my little thought experiment, shut up burglary theorist, where I showed that video of me pondering, what if we lived in a world where burglary was something you couldn't talk about? Oh, you're a burglary theorist. You think there was a burglary? What an idiot. Just because the window was smashed in and goods were stolen from the cash register and overnight. I mean, what do you think? It was a burglary? You're a weirdo. Uh, remember that thought experiment? Uh, and how... Well, we could essentially, I mean, we know it would be the burglars who would benefit from that the most because and no one could even talk about burglaries because, oh, that's a burglary theory. Uh, well, actually, here is that defense in use. It's just in the, uh, the, the corporate defense of conspiracy theory. What, you think that we would sell something that we knew wasn't safe? Ah, conspiracy theory. And the question is, would the media lap up this angle on the case, so you better you better believe they would. In fact, every single interview that you'll find about this Reuters article that came out at the time last month notes precisely that. And on what ground uh, is Johnson and Johnson saying that that your piece is a complete conspiracy theory? I don't know. You'd have to ask them. I don't know. You'd have to ask them. Yeah. Yeah, you would have to ask them. And it's not just one interview. It's, as I say, every interview. Well, joining us now is the Reuters reporter who broke this story, Lisa Girion from Los Angeles. Lisa, welcome. Thank you. What would you like to say in response to these charges that this is in a, a conspiracy theory you're reporting this morning? <laughs> Literally opening the interview. What would you like to say to the response that this is a conspiracy theory? <laughs> I mean, that's that's the hard hitting journalism that these journalists are getting. They're they're looking. Oh, this is a big, long, detailed report with lots of facts and information and documents and quotations, citations. I don't want to go through all that. Oh, here's the corporate response. It says conspiracy theory. Hey, I know what I'm going to lead with when I interview this journalist. So there you go. That's the way it plays out. Now, as I say. This Reuters reporter, again, this isn't exactly the the be-all and end-all of the biggest uh, big pharma expose you've ever read. And the reporter goes out of her way to downplay and make sure that she's very calm and safe with all of her statements throughout all of the interviews. Would you use J&J uh, &J baby powder, Lisa? I, I, you know, I don't think what I do really is relevant. Now, I'm just curious, because uh, I'm sure maybe now even, you know, friends, family members might be asking you, hey, you know, what do I do about this? And I, I think that's a question for U.S. consumers, but uh, don't mean well, to put look, you on the look, spot. No, well, let me just say, um, my report does not at all talk about um, the products that they're selling today. I haven't looked at, you know, there's no evidence that what they're selling um, today is has any asbestos in it. All right, so that's the way that... Uh that they handle that in the interviews. And you might think that's a bit mealy-mouthed and not pushing it enough, but I think uh, when I first picked up on the story from Morning Monarchy last month, uh, James Evan Pilato made, I think, a very good point about this, namely... So that's Reuters' Lisa Garion talking to CNBC and, and, and speaking very measured and making sure to cover her own ass. Now, she's not going to go down the road that Oprah did and lost big time to, of course, remember the cattleman? Because Oprah basically said, ooh, meat's nasty. I ain't eating that shit. So if Reuters Lisa Geary and said, oh, God, I don't use that stuff, then they're going to be able to say, ah, uh, she's tainting it with her own sort of personal feelings. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly it. Um, basically, that is a trap gotcha question. Oh, look, she's got some kind of vendetta against Johnson & Johnson. That she's making this personal. Oh, she won't use their product. So she's, you know, of course, that isn't what this report is about. This report is about the historical example that we know from the 70s to the 90s when they were sourcing this talc from the Italian Alps that it did contain traces of asbestos. This has nothing to do with what they're selling on the shelves today. So the, trying to bring that into the narrative is in itself a, a type of gotcha that would have, if she had responded by saying, I don't use it myself, or I don't think anyone should use it, if she said anything of that sort, then of course that's exactly what the way Johnson & Johnson would spin it. Then everything would be about this reporter. So it is a gotcha question. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, which is why I don't think you know, anyone can fault this reporter for answering in that way in this case, uh, because it isn't irrelevant to the story, and it's just a distraction, and it's just a type of gotcha. And as James M. Pilato points out there, it's the, the same thing with, you know, Oprah going off on the cattle industry and getting sued into oblivion for it. Well, not into oblivion, but anyway, getting sued handily for it. Um, so uh, it's interesting to watch from the propaganda perspective the, the unfolding of this story from the initial report 
plenty of data, plenty of evidence, internal documents released through the court process. Here it is. Let's compile it. We'll make notes on it. We'll put this together. This is an extremely comprehensive report. We'll show step by step what the company was thinking and how it was responding and what it was doing. And then the company just comes out with one statement saying, ah, this is an absurd conspiracy theory. And suddenly that's the narrative that all of the talking heads in the corporate media go with because they know what side their bread is buttered on and they're not going to a challenge too deeply. They're certainly not going to get into the really nitty gritty details of something like this and bring up documents and what was said by whom when. They're just going to say, so is this a conspiracy theory? Anyway, uh, hey, here's a little free lesson for any uh, corporate PR executives in the corporate report audience. Just say, as an expert conspiracy theory that our company has ever done anything wrong, and you'll, you'll be able to set the pattern. And also for any journalists that want to undermine any actual journalism that's being done, just have the reporter on and say, well, well what, you know, A, what is, the, what is your response to this being a conspiracy theory? And B, well, do you use these products yourself? What do you think? What's your idea on this to make the reporter into the story? A couple of, I think, interesting and valuable lessons um, from this so far. And hey, don't worry, guys. Johnson & Johnson stock's going right back up after this, so it's a good time to buy in. <laughs> uh, craziness. Anyway, we'll see what happens with the more than 10,000 uh, litigants in the, the ongoing lawsuit against Johnson & Johnson for this baby powder. But from the propaganda perspective, we've already seen how it's uh, been largely mitigated. And it's quite easy to do so. That's the lesson for this week in terms of propaganda on Propaganda Watch. Again, please do stay tuned for Propaganda Watch uh, every week, hopefully, as we go forward in the new year. And plenty of more fresh content coming out on CorporateReport.com in the coming days. So please do stay tuned for that. James Corbett, CorporateReport.com. The Corbett Report is brought to you by the Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.